So welcome, Dr. Rada. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Oh, I'm really good. Thank you, Clay. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. I think before we before we kind of started recording, I was just saying how much I admire you and how I've come across your work. So I'm actually really honoured to be here. So thanks so much. That's so nice. That's so nice. Feelings very mutual. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> Where, whereabouts are you? Where are you joining us from today? So I'm joining you from home today, um, not far out of London, about sort of 40 minutes out of London. So yeah, it's um, it's been a funny year, hasn't it? Because obviously, although um, I'm doing bits and pieces outside of home, obviously for all of us, um, or quite a lot of us, we've spent a lot more time at home. Um, so it's it's been an interesting thing to get used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. normally how- I'm in lots of different environments, you know, meeting lots of different people and um, running around um, London so it's actually been quite an interesting shift for me and quite a lot of self-reflection about how I felt about that which has been quite interesting. Yeah that's very interesting yeah I think for me because I worked from home anyway all my clients are online I do a lot of online courses in a way my life hasn't been that different Mm. but I do really feel for people whose obviously lives have been completely turn upside down or work has completely changed if you're used to being out and about all the time mm. what what else I'm really curious now you mentioned that what, what <laughs> have you kind of learned about this time um, um in terms of what have you been reflecting on so I've definitely I, mean, I already kind of knew this but I think it's definitely clarified for me how much I love being around people and um people's energy and how I sort of um get more energy from being around people as well I think that's definitely clarified that for me but also I think it's really brought home for me um the kind of positive energy that I, I would get from just encountering strangers, people that I didn't know or I don't know, just going to the train station every day and buying a ticket, saying hello to the, you know, the person behind the cashier desk or saying thank you to someone, you know, who held open a door for me or, you know, all of those little things that you you don't really notice when you have them a lot. But when you have less of them or less chance for interaction like that, I think you really miss them. So I've definitely noticed that. I think the other thing that perhaps has happened for a lot of people is you start to reflect on um, how you've been balancing your life, like how much of your life has been work, how much has been about joy, like where have you been putting your pots of time and in which areas and um, what have you been prioritizing? I think it's been helpful and interesting for me to look at that and think actually, you know, I was running around perhaps a little bit too much (laughs) and you know interesting to kind of step back and go okay what do I want to change it how do I want to change it and how will I do that if I want to so interesting fascinating fascinating and yeah I know what you mean about those little encounters with with strangers and you know you often have that sense of I always get reminded about how good people are when people are kind to you like they you know pick something up when you've dropped it or something obviously we can't yeah. really do that now if someone drops something in the street you can't pick it up oh, did you, <laughs> it's so that funny you said that example because I was at a petrol station the other day and this um it was an older gentleman who was paying at the sort of the the counter when we weren't actually allowed in it was just at the window and he dropped his wallet and my initial reaction obviously instinctive reaction was to go and pick it up for him and give it to him but I couldn't so I was standing there going excuse me yeah. that. and it yeah. felt so uh, so weird like you said those small things having said that there are other ways we can hopefully still get it so I think it's just about adapting isn't it we've had to do a lot of adapting this year yeah yeah I've got to find other ways to to connect with people and and be kind and yeah support each other it's definitely mm. been a theme of this year um can you share a little bit about what it is that you do kind of taking a step back um and yeah hearing a bit more about you would be great and how how you got to where you are today and the sorts of things that you do yeah so um I'm a GP so I'm um, a medical doctor um and so I started off doing hospital medicine for about five or six years and then switched into general practice um and then after sort of maybe three four years of doing full-time general practice I I really miss just working in different environments. I've always loved um, changing and learning new things and and meeting new people. And I love being creative as well. So I sort of thought, actually, how can I get more elements of that? So I sort of stepped back and thought, okay, what else can I do? So I do other other sort of roles as well. But the, the, the broadcasting role really came up by sort of random, really. My sister saw an advert for a BBC Three programme in um, Bristol, where she worked. And she brought it back for me, probably about about 12 years ago now and she sort of said oh why don't you have a go at this and I was like why why would I do that you know I I was never really anyone to do I didn't do drama I wasn't in plays at school in fact I was like a 
I was a tree and a statue in a lot of my place. <laughs> I never, um, but I always loved teaching and I always loved um, explaining and um, trying to come up with solutions. So anyway, I, I applied for that um, on at the request of my sister telling me off not if I didn't. And I got that and I absolutely loved it. And I loved the creativity and um, understanding and hearing people's stories and learning from people. Um, and so once I sort of decide that I like something, I tend to sort of go for it and, and just try to see if I can get more opportunities. So after that, I, I literally kind of sent out loads of emails. I, I kind of thought about ideas, how I could connect with people to do more broadcasting. And then I got particularly interested in mental health, emotional well-being, um, understanding who we are, what matters to us and how we can help each other through our stories um, and what what I can learn also from people when I'm understanding their story. Brilliant. That's yeah, that's amazing that you that kind of came across by chance. And then it's clearly been such a good decision for you to go down that path and you're so natural at it. And yeah, it's great. Oh, thanks. Well, actually, sometimes people say to me, have you had have you had media training? I'm like, no, not at all. I've never <laughs> had any media training. They're like, all oh, right, okay. And I'm like, maybe I should do, maybe I should have some. So, but yeah, no, I think um, Joe, you know, I think it's a, a lot to do with, I mean, like like you do as well. I think it's about um, I mean, I suppose being um being a, a doctor as well has very similar skills in that you're communicating, you're listening, you're trying to come up with solutions um but yeah I just love it and actually I think um I started to realize maybe five six years ago that it really um is my passion to help people um empower themselves to make good choices to understand themselves to if they want to be in a different place then how can they get there and I love helping people do that and I also love learning myself how I can do that from other people because we're all learning from each other which is why it's so amazing um you know the process of talking and and sharing things is so amazing because we actually we can learn from every single person that we meet if we open our ears and actually listen yeah absolutely and I I first came across you I think it was on Twitter and I love the things that you share on there about little tips and tools that we can be doing to help ourselves you know emotionally and mentally and I saw that one of the things you were talking about um, recently was um, the importance for young children to talk about their emotions and I wondered if you could could share a little bit about that. Yeah so um, I was lucky enough to do a CBB's program called Feeling Better it, it was about came out about two years ago and it was pre preschool children and it was all about emotions and feelings um, and I lived in a little house with two puppets who are brother and sister called Ben and Bria and every episode was a feeling so feeling sad feeling angry with animations and songs and stories and it was really to help children understand what is an emotion what is a feeling what does it mean where might it come from and what can I do with that um, to help myself feel better and that that program was everything that's kind of in my heart really because I think that you know Every, the way we perceive the world, the way we behave, the way we are in the world, not just to other people, but to ourselves, very much stems back to, you know, who we think we are, how we treat ourselves and how we understand ourselves. So when we understand our, our, our thoughts, our feelings, or we can at least be aware of them, then we can make good choices for ourselves and we can understand where we're coming from where they might be coming from where they may have started and we can start to unpick or unlearn some of the conditioning or some of the messages that we've been given because when we're when we're born when we're little we don't think you know we never wake up and say oh I'm a terrible person I got that wrong I should have known better and yet we learn as we get older either from society or perhaps how we interpret the messages we're given that actually it, it's my fault or I'm, I'm bad or I should have done this. And so I think the process of understanding feelings at a young age is to empower someone, empower all of us to understand that when we take time to do that, that's our foundation. And when we get the foundations right, we can then make good choices for ourselves and we can make good choices and help other people as well make good choices. And it's that whole thing about connection, you know, all that thing about love, connection. It's about feeling heard and feeling valued. And once someone else hears our feelings and our thoughts, then we feel more connected and then we're, we're stronger together. Yeah. When you were saying that, I was, I was thinking about 
what I was like as a young child, had a lot of tantrums, a lot of kind of big <laughs> feelings, but I don't, I don't, well, I don't remember, but I don't think, you know, when I was growing up, there was really much talk about emotions or how to deal with them or that vocabulary or kind of really even acknowledging things. And so I was just thinking about how, how important it is, I think, at that young age to, to have those skills and, you know, our emotions are the most are they most the most important thing like your mm. your emotional health and your mental health is arguably equally as important or maybe more important than your physical health you know Absolutely. and yet we don't really have that understanding of it well we didn't but I think I think it's getting more and more spoken about definitely and like you say actually the you know I would probably say you know that our mental health and our emotional health actually instructs our ability to look after our physical health because you know we see a lot um and I get a little bit frustrated with this sometimes but you know, on television you see a lot of programs about dieting how to do this in a certain number of days and I think to myself hang on a minute and that they're, they're, they're focusing on food and diet and all that because I'm thinking actually take a step back you know let's look at how that person is feeling what they're thinking what they've gone through why 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 are they in that position or what are their thinking patterns you know how are they contributing to to them being in a place they don't want to be in and so actually you can you can trace everything back to our psychology and how we're thinking about something what we associate it with how we frame that so I think it is the basis of our physical health and, and understanding that so this year I feel like we're being asked as, as a world to kind of go back to our foundations and ask ourselves what's important what really works and I think on an individual basis there is an opportunity to, for us to do that as well and really make it meaningful when we talk about emotional and mental health and really make it matter because it really does mm. <laughs> and sometimes we make everything so complicated and I'm like actually it's quite simple but we make things more complicated than they need to be and we need to draw back perhaps and prune back a bush or a tree and actually get back to the, to the base of that and what it actually means yeah I suppose we do really separate out mental health and physical health but they are so connected and your brain is a part of your body yeah and I don't know what the I'm sure I've seen somewhere that you know stress how much stress can can exacerbate physical issues or mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I meet a lot of people who have IBS or they get headaches or you know these physical kind of manifestations of their emotional and mental state you know so mm -hmm. so absolutely same as yeah. same as lots of skin conditions and I think there are lots of other conditions that we don't perhaps we can't perhaps quantify but you know when people report that they've been under stress you know people's physical health uh, often you know deteriorates as well so what you know we are again I think we as a, as a society we try to split things up and splinter them off but actually I feel like we need to get all those little splinters and bring them back into that one one being again and say actually this is where we need to focus this is where we need to concentrate on and and just going back to the emotions for children you know, when we have the language or the tools to express how we're feeling or to understand we can then you like I say kind of have we're on that path or that bridge or that journey to actually making a better choice in terms of our self-esteem because I don't think we talk about self-esteem enough as well actually and confidence and what that means mm -hmm. yeah 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 I, I want to ask you more about that actually I, I wanted to also go back to something you said uh, just a moment ago about thinking things that are our fault when we're kids and I have to say this comes up so much when I'm working with clients and also in my own life I know that I took on board thinking that like my parents bad mood or anger was my fault and took on board like some shame around that mm -hmm. and how you know how powerful it must be at that age to kind of learn a, learn a bit about that and learn that actually things aren't our fault parents have their own moods their own lives mm -hmm. they they do things parents get divorced and it's nothing to it's not your fault and, and those sorts of messages mm, um, absolutely and I, I you know similarly I, I you know I was a um as labeled as quite a, sort of a very sensitive child <laughs> you're oversensitive you know you're a warrior and I very you know like you very much blame myself for everything and would always try to be a peacemaker and you know um say yes all the time and apologize for anything and I've tried as, as I've got older to step away from those sort of those sort of patterns and recognize where they came from and, and why they were there and I think a lot of us blame ourselves when we're little because we well for several reasons but one is that we can't understand necessarily what's happening 
is perhaps too big to, for us or perhaps we're not getting it broken down in a in a language or a conversation that is we're able to break it up into and process it but also it's um if we blame ourselves then we tend to feel like we're more in control because if it's our fault then we can change ourselves in inverted commas so that then that doesn't happen again whereas in actual fact it's the reverse it's actually that, you know, we can't control things in life, but what we can control is how kind we are to ourselves and how we speak to ourselves and how we recognise that actually all of us are doing the best that we can do at any, any one point in time. But it, I think it's about, you know, when we blame ourselves when we're little or even now, we we sort of, I think it's trying to get that sense of control, but actually all it does is, is obviously affect our, our mental health. Yeah, and if we think we can control things, we're going to maybe be safe people pleasing yeah so yes. to try, trying to control things to feel safe yes Absolutely. yes I don't know that feeling yeah and then you reach the point where you're like actually I'm so tired of trying to control things and trying to feel safe that that you know for some people that's the moment when they break through and say I've got to give up control or try to we can't ever give up control it's not in our nature but what can we do to try and relinquish more of that and actually put our energy into what we can control which is you know being aware of our feelings and our thoughts and that the daily habits to help us with those and the daily habits to keep ourselves well and I think that's where our point of power is we think it's in controlling other things but that's where our point of power is and, and that's what will help us feel safe mm, yeah I love that can we talk a bit about self-esteem because you mentioned it there I think you said we don't we don't talk enough about it yeah, we, we don't at all. We kind of just expect it to be there. And kind of <laughs> when, you know, when, when we all inevitably fall down, you know, at some points in our lives, not feeling like we're, we've got good self-esteem or confidence, or we start to, to feel certain ways about ourselves. And we're like, oh, why is this happening? And I'm really keen on starting to encourage that conversation around, well, your know, self-esteem just doesn't come to you. It's, it's a, it's a thing that we have to build ourselves but also help and empower children young people all of us to build so what does it what does self sometimes these concepts like self-esteem and self-love like they're they're lovely but when you say the words people are like well, what does that mean you know I know I should have good self-esteem but what does that actually translate into daily and it's very much around those kind of daily practices isn't it of of showing yourself that respect that kindness that love so you know if you are feeling sad to say to yourself you know, don't worry, you're okay, have a cry, ring someone, it's not your fault, don't push it away. Um, Self-esteem, it's like saying to yourself or encouraging yourself to recognise, step back and reflect on what you have achieved, what you've got through. And actually, one of the social media posts that I did this year, which really resonated with so many people, was one about things to be proud of. And there were so many people commenting on that. And I just thought, wow, that's really interesting and that that really reflects how I think we don't stop, reflect, say well done, um, you know, tell ourselves actually this has been a really tough time. What how, what have I managed to achieve? What have I learned about myself? We're always just told we need to do better. We need to carry on. So I think there is a huge, a bit like watering a plant that's quite thirsty and dry. Um, and I'm I'm a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a one for not watering my plants regularly. Um, you know, when you water it, it soaks it up. And I do feel like that kind of kindness for ourselves and that ability to stop and be proud of ourselves is actually a little bit like that. We need to we're trying to soak up that from wherever we can because there's been a deficit of it. And and when you when you talked about when you talk about um, being proud, I know that it can be really hard to do for some people accepting mm. compliments can be almost impossible for lots of people that I speak to and the thought of being proud of yourself I mean it's almost like it's not good to be proud like you love mm. yourself is an insult <laughs> yes, <laughs> I remember yes, at school you. people saying oh you love yourself oh you yeah love yourself. So that true. was like so yeah true. an insult yeah. and actually I think we need to change that that it's actually healthy to be proud of yourself it's not something that's arrogant yeah it's actually I think comes from really not feeling good and trying to prove something um yes and, and like you say kind of those those basic things of sort of self-love or I think it's actually just about respecting yourself it's it's about saying um I mean my dad always says to me when I'm having a little bit of a, a tough time he says to me you know you have to be fair to yourself 
And I think that's a really good bit of advice. He's mm. like, you know, uh, Rada has to be fair to Rada. And it's true that we're not, you know, we, we're fair to other people when we stop and we give them praise and we say, don't worry, you know, that wasn't a mistake. You've learned from it. And I think we need to be fair. It's about being fair to ourselves and actually treating ourselves with fairness rather than judgment and shame and and criticism, which is just like the worst thing we can ever do. So just, you know what, even if you can't necessarily go to that step of loving yourself, what can you do to, to not criticize yourself or what can you do to be fair to yourself? I think that's a, a better question maybe to ask. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think sometimes love can seem out of reach if you're really in a yeah. in a low place or you're really down on yourself. It's like self-love is like, no, I'm not even not even close to that. But actually, can I be fair to myself? That seems a lot more manageable. I like yeah. I really like that. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you about um making things micro. And um I, I saw a post that you did around this that really, really struck me. You know, so much in life is very overwhelming right now. It's mm-hmm. very complicated and uncertain. Can, can you share about what, what you mean by making things micro? Yeah, I mean, that that kind of post came from me feeling a bit overwhelmed, actually. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is all just too much. And I think this year, you know, we haven't got, we've never really had any endpoints to anything. We still haven't got an end point to all of this. And it, there's so much that's so big. And it's a bit like a, you know, it's a bit like a big cloud, isn't it, in the sky? Is that when you, if you were just kind of hit by an individual raindrop, it wouldn't be so bad. But when you see that cloud and you start to think about all the raindrops in there and what and how you're going to get soaked, it just becomes a bit too much. So yeah, the whole post was really about trying to reframe everything on a smaller scale because then it's more manageable. So for example, instead of thinking about the next month or the next year, you know, in your in your thoughts or thinking patterns, trying to think about the next hour or the next day because that's more manageable, that's more solvable. You can see that, you can see the end point of the day. So what can you do in that day? If you've got a practical problem, like um, a financial problem or a problem with your job, for example, how can you break that down into a list and come up with tiny, small, practical solutions to the, the micro units of that? Well-being habits. We talk about well-being habits. That's another phrase, which is kind of a bit, <laughs> a bit general, a bit meaningless. How can you translate that into daily moment to moment actions that are going to make you feel better? Um, and, and also things like, you know, to look, things to look forward to. This year, you know, we haven't had things to look forward to. So how can you make those not change those from sort of grand gestures or big things into tiny little things? So you've got something every single day that you look forward to. And the same with kindness. So small acts of kindness, those little micro acts of kindness actually can have a huge impact on how we feel. So small acts of kindness to yourself, but also other people. Um, So yeah, small is manageable. Mm. Big and overwhelming is absolutely not. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so taking everything one step at a time, one hour at a time, Mm. rather than thinking too far ahead, and breaking it down into little steps or little chunks that are more manageable when things are overwhelming. Absolutely. And our our thought patterns, you know, trying not to project too much into the future, I think is really helpful at the moment. So whenever your mind starts to wonder, what if, what then, say, hang on a minute, I'm here right now. What can I do right now? Because when you invest in now and your energy in in what you can do now to help yourself feel better or come up with a solution, that future is more likely, hopefully, to be to have a better outcome. Mm, yeah, that's really powerful. I think. Yeah, there's so much uncertainty. We don't know what the next six months are going to bring, and if you've got a mind that is on the anxious side, it'll go to the worst case scenario. You'll play out all these kind of possibilities and actually chances are things could, you know, things usually do end up turning out all right in the end. So Mm. let's just take things one, one kind of step at a time. Yes. And and actually it's helpful to, if you can't do that, it's difficult. And, you know, I think we've all found that difficult and myself included, try to think to yourself, okay, well, if I don't take things one step at a time and I do keep thinking about the future, what are, what are the repercussions of that? And the repercussions of that are you're going to get overwhelmed, tired, stressed, mentally exhausted and unable to deal with challenge. So if ever I'm finding something difficult to do, I always try to flip it to the reverse and say, OK, well, you're finding that difficult to do. But but what happens if you do the reverse or you don't do it? And if not doing the reverse is worse, then I can find the strength to do what I found difficult to do in the first place. <laughs> Ah, yeah. So it's almost like I often think of it in terms of we think we're we're keeping ourselves safe by thinking about the future and 
almost like ruminating or overthinking it's kind of our way of trying to prepare somehow but actually if we're tired and burned out and stressed and anxious we're not prepared in the moment to deal with whatever might come up so actually is there something to say that we're actually safer by being present by being in the here and now and um that's the way to be as safe as we can really absolutely totally that's where our that's where our power lies like you say then you've got that reserve haven't you left for actually so yeah we it worry is a it's a tricky it's a little trickster isn't it worry it's like it 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 lulls you into that false sense of control and like you're doing something and it will help but actually it's it's often the total reverse of that (laughs) yeah yeah speaking about kind of being overwhelmed um I wanted to ask you about emotional burnout we're hearing Mm -hmm. I I I don't know if everyone is hearing this but I'm hearing a lot about burnout Mm. people are talking about it I feel like a few years ago no one really was talking about it and now people are more and more um what 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 do you define that is because as as Mm. I understand it it's almost like people some different people have different definitions of what that even is um and what can we do if we feel ourselves getting into that into that state yeah, so you're right, there are lots of different definitions. So kind of burnout initially was very much um, defined related to work and to our sort of working life. So that was a kind of traditional definition. I think over the years, people have defined it in many, many different ways. And I think that's why it becomes a bit of a difficult concept because when there are too many definitions, you're like, oh, I don't, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> what is yeah. it? I mean, to, to me personally, it's it's about thinking about your sort of uh, emotional state as a as a sort of battery as a as a reserve as like a well if you like and you know getting burnt out means that you're you're drying that well out so it's so low there's nothing left in it um and to the point where it starts to affect your you know what you're able to do day to day and so i see it very much as a i mean that's the end kind of crisis point we don't want to get there we want to start looking at it before that so i would say Thinking about it more as an emotional reserve, perhaps, is useful. Um, so, you know, what can you do day to day to fill up your tank, fill up that well, that battery, and what kind of activities will work for you? And they're going to be different for every single one of us. So is it art? Is it gardening? Is it sport? Is it chatting to someone? You know, what brings you joy? We don't talk enough about joy either. I know it's been hard to find joy this year. And hard to talk about it but actually joy is a is a charger it's a refueler so what can you do in your day to bring yourself more joy so for me I think it's more about stopping checking in with yourself and asking yourself how am I doing where is my emotional reserve right now and do I need to actually invest some time into building that up again because it's running too low yeah mm, yeah yeah and I know I know I notice this in myself what can happen is I'm cruising along in life, like everything's going fine. And I think <laughs> yeah. to myself, I don't need to meditate. You know, I'm sorted. <laughs> oh, I don't need yeah. to like go and walk every day. And then something comes up in life. And actually mm. that's when I realize it's like an ongoing process that you've got to keep yourself topped up. Um, mm-hmm. Those emotional reserves kind of topped up and um, not get too kind of complacent with it. Kind of remember that actually, if something was helping you, there's a reason reason why you're doing it and you should keep doing it I think I think you're totally right I think we've all been a victim to that myself included and and you're right you kind of um, I was going to write a little quote the other day in fact I'll probably do it in the next couple of days about um, you know those those habits those things we do day to day um, don't treat them like fair weather friends you know the sort of friends that only turn up when all is well or you know actually you need them more like you say in those really tough moments but more to, to your point absolutely Chloe, you need them every single day to actually remain at that balance level and I think as humans you know myself included we all get a little bit lazy and we get a little bit oh it was fine you know I just instead of doing that which I know is good for me I'll do this and sometimes some days we need to do that we can't always be on top of it and, and we shouldn't ever feel like we need to be but I think it's just about recognizing um how important it is and I think once our once we recognize what something does for us then it actually falls, slips very easily into becoming a habit. We don't necessarily need effort. And I, I remember when I started to uh, to do some more running. Now I've always loved sports, but I was never really a long distance runner. I was a bit more of a sprinter because I used to find long distance quite painful and quite boring. But <clears throat> when I started to um, do a bit more running, I initially, you know, I didn't like it. My brain was like, oh, this is really painful. Stop, it's too much. And then, and then I started to recognize how much better I felt afterwards. And then after a sort of a couple of weeks of that, you make that association automatically. And so then actually you want to do it. 
not for the running, but because you actually feel better afterwards. So I think it's about slipping into a habit, not necessarily having to force yourself into doing something. Mm, yeah, that's that's uh, not fun if every single time you do it, it feels like a struggle. It needs yeah. to be um, <laughs> something that, yeah, hopefully yeah. you so associate with those positive effects yes. and can keep yeah. going. Um, we are transitioning through autumn into winter. And I think a lot of people are starting to um notice I mean I think yeah a lot of people feel the change of seasons and particularly mm-hmm. in winter whether you've got seasonal affective disorder or whether you just you love being outdoors I think particularly as we're looking at lockdowns and kind of facing this winter that looks a bit bleak mm-hmm. um are there things that you would suggest for kind of how to deal with the kind of yeah the, the incoming winter that we're facing Mm, I think probably so I find autumn winter quite difficult actually myself so I think um going back to our earlier point not letting your mind jump too much ahead so don't keep thinking oh my gosh this is so long how am I going to get through this um because that's going to make you not get through it so um maybe like a little countdown thing is quite helpful I think counting down rather than counting up kind of helps you to keep going and motivated so I've been doing these kind of like being well like little backpack tips on my social media and Um, when it became autumn when the seasons changed I worked out there were 181 days until spring and so I've I've been doing like a little daily tip every day and it's almost like counting it down I think counting it down helps you to see a bit of a sort of psychological end point so that's helpful I think also accepting that it's here we can't change it we can't take it away we can't stop autumn and winter so if we can't change it, then we need to accept it and work with it rather than against it. It's always help, more helpful for us to do that. So how can you work with it? I mean, I I bought some thermals. I've bought a head torch so I can go out and see friends in the evening when it's dark. So I think, think about practical ways that you can still get what you need from autumn and winter. How can you still get connection? How can you still remain active? How can you still find the joy? And how, what's the autumn or winter version of that compared to spring and summer? You know, like mm-hmm. what's the autumn winter season <laughs> kind of collection looking like if you're talking about the equivalent of clothes or anything else. I think working out practical things. I also think nature is so important um, in autumn and winter. So if you're able to, to just try and get as much natural daylight as possible, because we know that's good for us. We know it's good for our mood and our sleep patterns. So, you know, can you go out for a walk at lunchtime? Can you sit next to a window while you're working at home? Um, that's really helpful. But also, you know, um, autumn and winter in nature is a is a time for consolidation, stopping, but also there is growth under the surface of the soil. There's new beginnings. So if you can look at nature, I think nature really helps us to realize that yes it is going to be difficult but there is always hope there's hope under the soil though the snowdrops will come out and I know that's kind of very sounds very airy fairy but actually nature for me gives me hope it gives me a sense of continuity and the fact that this will come to an end and and that actually there is always something on the other side of that end and that difficult time I love that way of thinking about it um yeah I suppose it it does come down to how can we reframe it I don't know if it was you I think it was you that posted about reframing a rainy day as like a cozy day a cozy (laughs) day (laughs) that sounds like one of my posts yeah yeah (laughs) yeah 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 and I saw someone when we went went into the first lockdown Mm. um someone had reframed it as like it's cozy time it's time Mm. to kind of stay indoors to take care of yourself to slow down to go inwards perhaps and can we kind of see the gifts that are in whatever season that we're in? Mm. Um, but yeah, definitely. I busted out the hot water bottle yesterday. <laughs> I, yeah, mine. <laughs> I, I used to have hot water bottles as a kid and I never had one as an adult until like a year ago. And now I'm yeah. like, how have I ever lived without a hot water bottle? Absolutely. I've got, I've got mine as well. I, got, I think I got mine out in early September. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to need this one. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> um, are there any other things that you do to support your own mental health? I know we've, we've talked about quite a few things and you mentioned kind of running, but are there other things that you really like to do or that really have helped you? Mm. Um, getting back into reading has really helped me. So um, I think, you know, all my time sort of studying, I, I kind of, you know, reading became like a, a thing associated with exams or studying. So I think I've now definitely this year started to read more, which I absolutely love because it's um, it's a break for your mind to be taken into a totally different world. And I tend to read um, 
really imaginative sort of stuff that takes you into a different world like totally like things like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or you know things that are totally right. just out there. Or Philip Pullman for example because I think that um, our imagination is also a great tool you know our imagination we can use to make us frightened or anxious and we frequently do and worry but we can also use imagination that same imagination actually can take us into a, a world where we feel better we have a distraction we can imagine or think about good things so I I'm trying to really use my imagination um, rather than to fear or to worry to flip it on its head and say okay well, what can I imagine that's positive what can I imagine that's joyful so imagination is a tool so reading for me definitely um, and music music I just love because it's a bit like a pick and mix you know you can choose the music to suit your mood or the music to actually help you process a particular emotion and, and come out the other side of it so whether or not that's feeling a bit angry and frustrated and stressed and going cycling listening to you know faithless insomnia or <laughs> or whether you want to feel empowered and listen to a bit of um Florence and the Machine or you want a bit of joy and you listen to some summer tunes whatever that may be music for me has been really really great actually as well mm, yeah I love that isn't it amazing how you can just get any song in the world like within seconds on Spotify or YouTube it's amazing I, I it is amazing like, oh my god like when, <laughs> when yeah, we yeah. growing up it was like you get your cassette where you hopefully yes. record something off the radio and then you can get your yes. favorite song Yes, I remember sitting there on the Sunday charts and being like, yes. this song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or doing like a little mixtape. Yeah, but I think I think that's I think that's great. I think I think actually again this year we've been reminded about how important the arts are and how, how important creativity is in a world that is very focused on uh productivity in terms of outcomes, churning content out. I think we've really remembered, or I hope we will remember the importance of creativity whatever that might be that might be drawing art music it might be gardening it might be coming up with ideas there's lots of different, different ways we can be creative but creativity again is a, is a great tool for for well-being and for joy and the arts are just so important for that so I think that's really helpful to rebalance our sort of our, our mental bodies if you like of like I must do 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 into hang on a minute there's also the another side which is the foundation which is creativity into BBB I think that's really helpful as well mm, yeah yeah I love it <laughs> oh I've got one more question for you final question yeah. what what is most important to you right now uh, oh, that's a really good question. Um, the most important thing to me at the moment is obviously um, health, the people that I love. Um, and I think doing what I can do to put some positive things out there in the world. Um, I think my, you know, my priority really has changed from thinking too much about the future into actually just getting through each day. Um, but I think also what's important is that we, I hope that we will remember some of the lessons that were being shown. And I'm hoping very much that we won't forget those and we will we will kind of step into a, a new phase of focusing more on community, on what emotional health is and our ability to connect and, and help each other. Yeah. Mm, beautiful, well, thank you. Oh, such a Aww, pleasure. Thank you so much for everything <laughs> you shared been so so good can you um share where people can find you and anything that you're they can get involved in or yeah where where are you where are you hanging out on the internet <laughs> yeah so I'm on twitter at dr rada modgill I'm on instagram at dr underscore rada um I'm doing lots of different things I, I post up kind of things most days um all sort of trying to help and be positive so yeah lots of different bits and pieces so yeah you can find me on there brilliant thank you so much such a pleasure. Thanks, Chloe.